Ricardo. I'm the national co-coordinator of UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition. War Coalition, which was really started in 2010, as some others in the anti-war movement were kind of backing off the anti-war movement, the um, uh, huge mobilizations of the early days of the Iraq War um, had kind of subsided. Some people in the anti-war movement uh, thought with the Obama administration we were going to see some basic uh, change in anti-war policy, and people were backing off. And a number of folks from the anti-war movement felt that it was not time to back off, and, per, and even felt that wars were going to continue and be more endemic and part of the whole system, political economic system of this country in years to come, and I think we were proven right. So in 2010, uh, 800 anti-war activists met at a conference up in Albany, New York, and formed UNAC. Um, there were two new directions for the anti-war movement that came out of that conference. One is we took a very strong position um, against uh, Zionism, against Israel, against, uh, we called for all, um, uh, an end to all aid uh, uh, to Israel, not just military aid, um, and we supported uh, the right of self-determination for Palestinians, um, the right of return, and, and uh, Palestinian rights in general. Um, the second was we started using a slogan that we were against the wars abroad um, and the wars at home, because we saw mm -hmm. a, a clear component of the wars that were happening um, uh, in this country. Uh, in the beginning, um, it started with uh, the Muslims. Um, of course, it was going on for years and years and years in minority communities in this country. But with the Muslims, there had been uh, serious attacks where the FBI was sending people into the mosques around the country and trying to cajole, bribe, do whatever they could to get Muslims to make statements or do something that would appear illegal. And to, to date, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, it's not reported much, of Muslims that are in jail who have never committed a crime. Uh, the, the Muslim Solidarity Organization started calling it preemptive prosecution because it was the idea that they were saying things or perhaps they could do something in the future. Um, and there are many, many hundreds. In fact, there are special Muslim prisons. They're called CMUs, Communication Management Units, where they're basically kept in solitary confinement, which is torture um, uh, in this country. And so as an example of that, out of the Albany Conference, at the very end, we marched the Albany Conference to a local mosque where two men, actually several men, had been attacked by the FBI, but two, there was a big case in the Albany area, and we held a rally there in solidarity. Um, and then we started seeing attacks on unions, uh, austerity programs, attacks on stop and frisk in minority communities, black communities, and we all know what's uh, been mm. going on in Ferguson, which has been going on for a very, very long time in this country. But in Ferguson, we saw a fight back, which, you know, inspired all of us, and we all stood up with the folks in Ferguson. And this was all part of the war, as well as uh, war at home, as well as the uh, spying on all of us through the NSA and so forth. So an anti-war movement can't um, uh, not talk about those things. So these are the um, some of the differences that UNAC has gone forward with and continues to go, go forward with. Um, and so today we have a panel which is called um, uh, End the U.S. Wars Around the World and at Home. And we have a, a group of panelists that will speak probably around 10 minutes each. Um, and then we have a very important announcement at the end of that, uh, followed by questions and discussion. Um, and so I hope you'll give us your, your thoughts and your opinions at that point. Um, our first speaker is uh, Margaret Kimberly. She is the editor and senior columnist for uh, Black Agenda Report. She is also a member of the UNAC Administrative uh, Committee and uh, Black Agenda Report. Last night, Margaret played a major role in their great fundraiser that took place um, uptown at Riverside Church, uh, which I and others uh, attended and uh, got a real education last night. Uh, this is Margaret Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the war on, as, as Joe pointed out already, the war on African-American people is certainly 
not a new one. Uh, the fact that the term African American even exists is proof enough, uh, unlike other uh, hyphenated um, identifiers, uh, black people did not come here voluntarily. The legacy of that experience, 200 years of enslavement, followed by Jim Crow segregation, uh, and the mass incarceration, incarceration state pretty much sums up the war against black people. And now there are new worsening threats to us and to everyone in the country. Um, even as it dis disintegrates, as it collapses, capitalism is more voracious than ever, probably because it is collapsing, I should say. Americans, uh, but uh, low-income people, suffer from these things even more, live in various schemes of debt peonage, such as payday and student loans, job loss, low-wage work, and watch as public education is privatized and uh, our neighborhoods and our cultures are lost to gentrification. Of course, nothing shows a, a nation in collapse, uh, people in collapse, like mass incarceration, which brings back all the horrors of chattel slavery. America leads the world only in the number of people it holds behind bars and the amount of military spending, which is larger than that of all the other nations in the world combined. So black people now face the worst of all possible worlds. We have been under continuous assault since the powerful but too short-lived lived, uh, liberation movement of the 1960s. In that time, a large number of uh, black people moved into what has called the middle class, meaning they were more highly paid workers. We need to dump the word middle class, it's meaningless. Um, but now all that has been torn asunder as the neoliberal experiment um, grows in strength and, and tightens the world in its grip. But I think it's important to, um, to talk about, um, uh, when we talk about the plight of black Americans, not to isolate our experience from what is happening in the rest of the world. Everyone on the planet is less and less free with each passing day. Uh, Human-made climate change is killing uh, crops, killing people. The process that causes it, fossil fuel production, has not just continued, but it's expanded. Residents of Beijing and Paris can't see their cities because of heavy smog, and West Virginians don't have clean drinking water because of coal production-based industrial accidents. The dynamics which caused the U.S. to instigate what could turn out to be a war with Russia are the same forces which have destroyed the jobs and, uh, and have kept millions of uh, black people in poverty. So the clock has turned back in a very insidious way, and I'll illustrate it in what I hope is somewhat humorous means. Um, I recently saw this meme on Facebook about uh, technological change, and um, it goes like this. Question. If someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life presently? And the answer, I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, but I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. <laughs> and um, that, I'm glad somebody chuckled, but, um, but I had another thought. How would I explain to someone from the 50s that in, two, that in 2014, black people would have fewer jobs and that more of us would be in prison than 60 years ago? How would I tell them about stand your ground laws or that the once thriving city of Detroit would shrink to nearly nothing? First because finance capitalism sent manufacturing overseas and then plundered that city with bizarre financial instruments or that public schools were owned by private corporations and that a meager 11% of American workers would be represented by unions. How would I tell that 1950s person that General Motors would not be the largest employer in the country, but something called Walmart would be instead? Uh, we cannot talk about progress until we bring these facts to light and give ourselves the language we need to have serious discussion. All these crises have, crises have come to a head in the last few years. Um, with the, uh, and we saw it in 2008 with the worldwide economic meltdown. But it wasn't really surprising. Japan was said to be in a state of stagnation for 10 years before that. The booming Wall Street stock market, the housing market, and the internet market all collapsed in a series of successive bubbles. The so-called Celtic Tiger in Ireland was a bubble, as was the collapse of the housing market in Spain and the entire economy of Iceland. And this has a lot to tell us about what ails black America. We live in a country and a world 
with a political and economic system that is cracking as we speak. The bailouts and the various economic plans put forward by politicians are akin to the Dutch boy putting his finger in the dike trying to stem a flood. So it's difficult to prosper in a failed state, and that is what America is now. Um, the economic crisis was followed by the election of Barack Obama to the presidency. And that turn of events could not have been more damaging to black people, uh, who of course suffered far worse from the downturn than any other group, but who by and large were head over heels in love with one man who got the job precisely because he assured the 1% group that he had no intention of rocking their boat. The war on black people is also quite literal. We don't know exactly how many black people are killed by police because there's no state or federal requirement that such data be produced and maintained. So individual citizens have had to take on this task. The Malcolm X grassroots movement estimates that a black person is the victim of an extrajudicial killing, like Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, every 28 hours in this country. Only black people die because they were walking in the street and not on the sidewalk like Michael Brown did in Ferguson, Missouri. There's another war on us which is exemplified by the plunder of Detroit, Michigan. Detroit's destruction began in earnest many years ago when the manufacturing base of this country was destroyed by the triumph of finance capital. The very last straw took place because that same finance capital used bizarre instruments, derivatives, which finally pushed Detroit over the brink and into bankruptcy. But when the city went bankrupt, it is the banks who got paid first and pensioners who took the hit. The bankruptcy and appointment of an emergency manager are themselves proof of the war against black America. In a referendum, Michigan voters said they did not want emergency managers to take over Detroit or any other Michigan city. So much for America and being a democracy that we talk about all the time. Now the mayor of that city and all elected officials are mere figureheads, with the emergency manager selling off assets, cutting off water, and allowing the Koch brothers, uh, I guess there's a pun, no pun intended, the Koch brothers storing open piles of pet coke in Detroit, which pollute the air. And it isn't a coincidence that Detroit's population is 80% black. Now that its assets have been stripped bare, the same lords of capital will declare Detroit a going concern and put money back in. A city in decay will suddenly be labeled thriving, but only after poor black residents have been driven out. It's easy to drive people out if they have more water. Recently, the city has been cutting off water to people who have been delinquent in their bills. And 27,000 uh, people so far have had their water show, uh, shut off. The United Nations sent to, um, at the request of activists in Detroit, rapporteurs to Detroit, and uh, who said in their report, quote, we were deeply, to, deeply disturbed to observe the indignity people have faced and continue to live in, to live with in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and in a city that was a symbol of America's prosperity, unquote. Wayne County is also notifying 70,000 households that they have been caught up in the foreclosure frenzy. We've decided to foreclose on, on everything, said uh, the city's treasurer. So Detroit is black America in extremis. New York City has the dubious distinction of being the stop and frisk capital of the nation. Kings County, which is Brooklyn, New York, is ground zero, the most gentrified county in the country. The neoliberal triumph has even destroyed public education, giving us charter schools black backed by wealthy people instead of public schools that are accountable to the public. So this war on black people didn't end because the 1% and the empire decided to rebrand themselves with the black president. Obama's presence in, often, in office is actually proof of the death of black politics and progressive politics, which means a lot more than having black politicians. So what's the way forward? It, the way forward is what it's always been. Um, Frederick Douglass said, agitate, agitate, agitate. And uh, that is our solution. It must come from mass action and a rejection of the political past, including an allegiance to the Democratic Party. That's the only way out for us. Actually, the first step in finding a way out is acknowledging that there is, in fact, a war against us and that we must fight back. And thank you.
unfortunately, you might see Margaret uh, cut out Sorry. early because she has another appointment, but she was very gracious to join us here today um, uh, in between her other appointment and, and the event last night. Um, I'm really happy about our next speaker. Uh, he's someone who just arrived back in the United States uh, Tuesday. He was the last three and a half years he's been in Gaza including during the um, last and the one before um, invasion, attack, occupation, bombing um, of Gaza by uh, Israel. Um, he's uh, Joe uh, Catron. He's a member of al New York, Palestinian Right to Return Coalition, and he's going to talk to us about his experience. Joe. Thank you. When I landed at JFK on Tuesday, I was asked a list of questions which I suspect face most travelers who are now returning from extended visits to the Middle East, especially those of us probably with a little bit of a tan. An agent asked me, did you attend any training camps? I said, well, I went to some training workshops and seminars on things like Twitter or writing press releases, but nothing too exciting, I'm afraid. <laughs> And then she asked me, but were you aware of any armed activities in the area? <laughs> was I aware? Yes, yes, I was. <laughs> ah, after three and a half years, there's a lot that I could say and recount about Gaza. Um, I'm going to try and keep my remarks brief and talk about three particular processes that I think are worth highlighting and watching in the immediate aftermath of the last offensive. And during the <laughs> question and answer period, I'll be happy to field anything you throw my way. Uh, the three things I'd like to talk about are all closely related. The first, which is what's on the minds of many people in Gaza right now, is simply reconstruction, digging out and rebuilding. I hardly need to recount the damage that was done in the last offensive, in addition to over 2,000 people who were killed and well over 10,000 injured. Um, something like a third of the Gaza Strip's population was displaced from their homes, about 600,000 people. Tens of thousands of those homes are still uninhabitable, either partially or completely destroyed. Many institutions, hospitals, schools, mosques as well were destroyed. And so now they face the prospect of rebuilding them, and since Israel controls access to the enclave since it decides what's allowed in or out. There are significant hurdles. Israel has now reached a deal with the United Nations as well as the Palestinian Authority whereby reconstruction aid will be allowed in. It took them a while. I think the first shipment of reconstruction aid only arrived in the past couple of weeks. But they'll let it in in exchange for the UN basically doing its work in supervising the siege not only supervising it, but also collecting intelligence. Israel, for example, will have access to a database listing every, every family who receives aid for the reconstruction of their destroyed homes. This, I think, and the role the UN is playing in it is something that could, should concern citizens of every UN member state, at least. The second thing, which I've already talked about a little bit, touched upon, is the siege. We now see minor improvements to the siege which was imposed by Israel, by the occupier, on the Gaza Strip beginning after the elections of 2006. In the recent weeks since the end of the offensive, Israel has announced that it will allow the export of Palestinian produce from the Gaza Strip to the West Bank. This is the situation they're dealing with. They can't export Palestinian products from one part of what's recognized by everyone as the Palestinian territory to another without the permission of the occupier, which has been withheld for nearly a decade. That's, also, that's beginning to change, it looks like. There are also preliminary discussions now about small numbers of Palestinian laborers being allowed to work inside the territory claimed by Israel, 48 Palestine. And small numbers of worshipers have already been 
allowed to visit Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem for the first time. Well, I should specify that it's the first time for Muslim worshipers. Israel has allowed small numbers of Christian worshipers to visit their holy sites from Gaza, but not Muslims. This is part of their divide and conquer strategy in an effort to sow dissent and division among Palestinians. And that brings me to the third point I want to touch on, which is reconciliation. In 2007, most of you know, or 2006, there were elections in the occupied Palestinian territories, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, which were won by the Hamas movement. I often hear knowledgeable, well-intentioned people say that Hamas won the elections in Gaza. This is misleading. Hamas's victory was actually more sweeping. They won a higher proportion of seats in the West Bank than in the Gaza Strip. But both Israel and what is called the international community, which essentially means the international, the Western powers led by the United States, refused to recognize that government, which had been elected by the Palestinian people. They refused to deal with, to deal with it, and eventually militias armed and equipped and trained by the United States forced clashes in the West Bank, in Gaza, which led to the division of these two enclaves, these two fantastans, concentration camps essentially, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. They were divided and each had a separate government. Those governments are now in the process of reconciling, of uniting after years of support for the division by both the occupier and what calls the body of countries that call themselves the international community. Now, on all these fronts, reconstruction, siege, and reconciliation, we see Palestinians winning significant victories. They're overcoming the policies of the occupation, which have worked against them. Of course, Israel, we know, does not give up anything without a fight. And I apologize. I know I keep alternating back and forth between calling it Israel and the occupation. It depends on how you look at it. I'm not too attached to either term. But they're not going to give anything up easily, which is why it's so important, I think, that there's been such a strong upsurge in solidarity activism, both during and after the offensive. We saw a little bit of that earlier today with the Block the Boat rally. Um, the Block the Boat action in Oakland will be tomorrow when hundreds, if not thousands, will once again try to prevent the docking and unloading of an Israeli Zim ship. And it's this kind of international pressure, I think, to an extent, I certainly don't want to downplay the role of the Palestinian resistance itself. They fought valiantly, especially on the ground, more than I think anyone, especially the Israelis, expected. And these victories are first and foremost theirs. But international supporters have certainly played a role in them as well. And I hope that moving forward, now that Gaza has for the time being disappeared from the headlines, I hope that level of support will continue. Thank you. Um, we're going to do questions at the end. We'll just get through. Well, if you want to not waste fossil fuel, you can keep them all up. Well, why don't we just turn on a couple? Yeah, why don't we compromise? <laughs> Peace act. Let's, let's compromise. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Sarah was just playing with the lights. <laughs> Well, is asked to do the heavy lifting on this um, uh, panel. She's going to talk about the uh, U.S. attacks on Iraq and Syria, which has been very confusing for a lot of people in the progressive peace um, uh, uh, movement in the United States. Sarah is a co-director of the International Action Center and a founding member and part of the UNAC Administrative Committee, founding member of UNAC and part of our Administrative Committee. She is an editor and co-author of four books on Iraq and ten books on U.S. on U.S. militarism. 
She has traveled to Iraq, Syria, Iran, Lebanon, and Palestine and helped coordinate major anti-war demonstrations in the United States and demonstrations to oppose racism, anti-Muslim, and anti-immigrant attacks. Um, this is Sarah Flanders. Well, thank you, first of all, to uh, UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition, because we really need to have forces working together who have some understanding of the wars that we're up against. And the wars really are endemic and they're relentless and every one of them has ended in a spectacular failure for U.S. policymakers from what they even declared at the beginning were their aims in the war. And yet it hasn't in any way slowed them down. Uh, and how can we understand this? There is, a, at the very moment that there is a pivot to Asia and an effort to destabilize countries in Asia that Bernadette will be taking up, there is an encirclement of Russia and an expansion of NATO that Greg will be taking up. There is an expanding war here at home. And there is the war in the Middle East that has marked the last 30 years, really, of U.S. Uh, history and every one of those wars has led to hundreds of thousands of deaths and destruction throughout the area and an imposition of, of sanctions that have led to again hundreds of thousands more deaths than those who even died in the bombing. Uh, so we ask ourselves what is going on and where is this going? Now I just wanted to, before I talk about ISIS and, and Iraq and Syria and Turkey and what's going on in the immediate region, to say that the problems of U.S. imperialism, U.S. as an empire, are systemic and they're incurable. And that is important for us to understand. They're based on a crisis going on in the capitalist system itself. Now, capitalism, all of us here, I think, would agree, is a ch chaotic and an <laughs> irrational and an unstable system prone to endless ups and downs. Now it, it is at a dead end. Its ability to bail itself out, even through military Keynesianism, that is no longer possible. It's a system that's based on crisis, and it can't control what is produced. Now, there's always been, as I say, these huge famines, depressions, massive unemployment, ruin for millions. The capitalist state, in its effort to avoid these economic collapses, sets in motion forces that it can't control politically or militarily. And some of that is what is going on now. Militarism is so interwoven with the imperialist state. It's been used for decades to prop up this imperialist order globally. And it is now out of control. It is the number one budget item. More than half of all the federal uh, outlays are to the military. And really much higher if you look at all the hidden expenses. And it's more the U.S. military is larger than the rest of the world's military put together. We have technology that's so massively productive that every startup immediately leads to a glut. So these processes are being accelerated, and I, I raise that because in an effort to forestall and control events globally, what U.S. policymakers are determined to do is reinforce the most reactionary and sectarian and divisive forces. Who are they in an alliance with? It's Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Qatar, United Arab Emirates, absolute di dictatorships. It's the Zionist state of Israel. Uh, and it's a U.S. military machine that more and more is using private contractors on a huge scale. I mean, we're, we're talking about hundreds of thousands. And organizing also, when you look at the invasion going on of Syria, this is not a civil war. 
you have military contractors and mercenaries now from 80 countries in Syria, in the tens of thousands. That's not a civil war. That is a war imposed from the outside. The U.S. wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan and the destruction of, Syria, of Libya were wars for total domination. And yet, what do they control even in Afghanistan today? They have no hope of continuing their domination as they withdraw from the region. So these are the, the forces that are in play. and it, and they're forces that can't always be controlled. That's the one important thing for us to understand. Now, when President Obama announced on September 10th that the U.S. military was going to build a new international coalition uh, for war on the Islamic State, and it was, as Bush had projected, a coalition of the willing, a coalition that didn't have United Nations approval, didn't even have NATO's approval, didn't have congressional approval. It was just a declaration that there was a new stage of war and bombing and troop movements. There are more than a thousand troops right now and tens of thousands more in the immediate uh, arena. Suddenly he had eight countries, then 30 countries that had signed on, none of them committing actual soldiers, any forces but signed on in name because they're assured that's the only way they're part of the booty, which is what these wars are all about. So that is an important, the, the absolute irrationality, the uncontrollableness of what is ISIS, ISIS or Islamic State or ISIL, it's, it goes by all different names, but uh, it's funding through Saudi Arabia and also through Turkey and, and the assistance from Israel are all a part of ISIS. And yet, in the name of fighting the Islamic State, and we can see this in the standoff that's been going on in Kobani with the Kurds, U.S. claims that they are on the side of, or at least that they're against ISIS. They can't say they're on the side of the Kurds. What do they really want to do? The Syrian Kurds had been in a kind of alliance with the Syrian government where they had autonomy. And that is what ISIS is being used to reorder, reorganize, and try to pull the Kurds away from any relation with the Syrian government. So you have a situation where the U.S. claims that they're doing an airdrop to Kobani, and mistake of mistakes, the airdrop falls into the hands of ISIS. Oh, too bad about that. And literally a mile, that's tank rounds go a mile, a mile away sits the Turkish military, just sitting, watching, and also providing the soldiers going through, the mercenaries, the forces. Now. Is this a war against the Islamic State? Or is this a new way of trying to reorganize the mercenary forces that they have sent in, in the tens of thousands, and also put them more consciously under the thumb of the US? But the, the creation of these forces, and, and now we hear that the, quote, new democratic opposition in Syria will be trained in Saudi Arabia, of all places. I mean, a real center of democracy I'm sure everyone here would agree. Uh, an absolute monarchy where beheadings are a daily occurrence in public. It's not like this is an extraordinary event in Saudi Arabia. So these are the forces that will be used to train for democracy in Syria. And it's a, a war that is multi-pronged. It's an effort to also go back into Iraq which had overwhelming opposition in every poll in the U.S., as there was overwhelming opposition to a new war in Syria. And without any vote, without any discussion, this has been pushed through. Now, can this continue? 
I think all of us here know that a major escalation is on the way because it's a completely unstable situation. It's a determination still for regime change against Syria. It is aimed directly at Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's very much directed at trying to destabilize and weaken Iran and to reassert U.S. domination of the region. Now, will it succeed? I, I truly think it will be as spectacular a failure as past U.S. wars, but it takes a horrendous toll, and it takes a huge toll here in the U.S. It takes a toll internationally that there would be $60 billion in new money for a war against the Islamic State, and yet the total funding for Ebola in Africa <coughs> is not at a billion, one sixtieth the amount. And what's the U.S. solution for Ebola in Africa? It's to send U.S. troops and build a 25-bed hospital after they get done building a huge new airfield and base in Liberia. These are the completely irrational choices that are being made again and again by a military that exists for super profits for U.S. corporations. That's why the military exists. It is to reinforce its control around the world, but it's also a constant giveaway, guaranteed profits at a time when everything else in the economy is going to hell in handbasket. And the, the cost for us here at home, uh, we face a complicated situation in the anti-war movement where the what's described in the news is so confusing for the average person that they really don't want to hear about it. The support for U.S. wars is lower than at any time in the past, no matter how they do the polls. Uh, the opposition to troops, whether it's in Syria or it's in Iraq or it's anywhere else, uh, Ukraine, no matter how they pose the polls, the majority of the population is against U.S. military intervention. No matter how they pose the threat, and yet the interventions are continuing and escalating and happening with growing repression here. So we, we have to much more consciously link the struggle against wars with the domestic problems right here. Now, that is something that, that part of the anti-war movement has pushed for uh, and tried to do for decades. There's another part of the anti-war movement that really exists only when there are Republicans in office. And the rest of the time, they kind of fold up shop and also insist that the rest of the movement folds up shop. Now, we can accept that or we can <coughs> consciously resist it and build a movement that is directed at building solidarity with struggles right here at home and opposition to all U.S. wars for any excuse at all. If you know nothing about what a war is, what excuses they're giving, whether it's the Islamic State or uh, Libya or Afghanistan or any one of the excuses they give or in support of a democratic movement in uh, Hong Kong or the Ukraine, any one of these movements that the U.S. claims to be supporting, we need a movement that says no. We refuse to stand with any of these movements because there's a lot of, there's both military means that are being used and I also want to raise the use of soft power. What are tens of thousands of NGOs that operate around the world as human rights organizations, as social organizations, they're very active on Facebook, they get millions and millions of dollars through USAID funding, National Endowment for Democracy, NED funding. Uh, these organizations really, uh, in terms of staff, are in the tens of thousands. 
And it means that they operate as a kind of pressure. They, that was certainly true in, in Syria at the very beginning of the outbreak of the struggle. It was true also, we could look at the Ukraine, we could look at any of the countries around the world, and we see the same um, measures being used, the same both soft power backed up by military power, backed up by CIA and mercenary forces. So drawing a line with them all is extremely important and, and recognizing that the, the U.S. agenda is destabilizing even for the countries that are its allies. Consider for Turkey today. Turkey suddenly has the problem of hundreds of thousands of refugees within Turkey and an unstable border. Of course, Lebanon has a huge problem with the sheer number of, of refugees, and a third of the population of Syria today is displaced. That's millions of people. It's about seven million people in Syria that are homeless and displaced because they are completely threatened by these mercenary bands. Now, that's destabilization on a massive level, and it uh, is destructive for the people of the region, but it also comes with a hatred for U.S. policy. We can make a huge difference because it's, pick, it's picked up around the world when there's the smallest action here, picket line, meeting, event. It is immediately, we, we do a picket line in Times Square and it is news in the countries that are targeted. There's a demonstration that could be in a small city. You think, oh, well, who notices here? And yet it is noticed by the people who are being targeted. So I think if we can focus on what the threat is and the way in which propaganda is used and the way in which the military machine is used, it's both bombing from the sky, but it's the mercenaries coming in from below, and it's the use of NGOs and soft power and social media together. Now, we can combine our forces together with the use of our own alternative media, with grassroots organizations, and with specific kinds of outreach that is targeting repression here at home and the growing problems of homelessness and hunger in the U.S. with the wars abroad. And the more we make those real links and build a movement that's consciously doing that, not, not just doing it on the exception from time to time, but is consciously building a movement shaped in that way, that will make an enormous difference for us in the period ahead and allow us to make a real political contribution uh, to the struggle, building solidarity with people under attack and refusing to be part of demonization of leaders or, or countries or struggles. That is the kind of movement I think we need. And I think really seeing the, the folks here, this is something that is understood on a, on a gut level right here. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We're going to push ahead and get into the question period. Our next speaker is someone who um, uh, was recently in Crimea, um, where he spoke to a lot of the folks that have been resisting the um, U.S.-supported Kiev um, fascist-backed government um, in Kiev as they've been um, really bombing and shelling and decimating uh, the uh, people of the eastern, uh, Cre uh, uh, eastern Ukraine. Um, uh, incidentally, um, because of the UNAC's stand in support of the right of the people of the eastern Ukraine, um, uh, th there's been some uh, Russian anti-war organization that has been contacting us, and as we were getting ready to do this meeting, they were aware that we were going to have a speaker on the Ukraine. So he, they've been um, texting me, <laughs> and, uh, you know, hoping it goes well and wishing us well and all this this kind of stuff. Um, so you're going to hear Greg Butterfield, who is the uh, um, head of the Anti-Fascist Solidarity Committee of the International Action Center, and he's recently returned from um, uh, Crimea. Uh, as I mentioned, he's going to talk about the situation um, in, in Ukraine.
Well, I want to thank Joe um, and UNAC for inviting me to participate today and really um, and thank um, UNAC for being um, really the only uh, anti-war coalition in this country that has taken this issue seriously and, and actually, um, you know, called days of action, held meetings um, around the country, coordinated different groups um, to, to raise this very, um, this issue that's very confusing and very divisive in a lot of the, the movement here. Um, <clears throat> as Joe said, I recently returned from Crimea, which is now part of the Russian Federation, um, where I met with um, set, uh, many anti-fascist activists who have been uh, driven out of Ukraine during the events of the past year uh, under threat of arrest or even death in some cases, uh, including survivors of the massacre that happened last May 2nd in Odessa at the House of Trade Unions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just want to, um, it's always challenging to talk about the issue of Ukraine and, and uh, the People's Re Independent People's Republics in the Donbass region now, Donetsk and Lugansk, because um, there's so much misinformation and so little understanding, even in sectors of the progressive movement, it's kind of hard to know how far to go back to start. So I'm just going to give a quick summary of the events of the past year. Um, that there was um, this long building um, uh, pro-Western movement called the Maidan or Euromaidan, uh, which really started to take shape um, around this time last year. Um, and, uh, and it took its name from the central square in Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. Um, and this movement um, was um, widely touted in the Western media and by the U.S. government and European governments as being uh, paragons of democracy. It was called a, an anti-corruption movement. But underneath what was really powering it, on the one hand, was money from the United States <coughs> through the, the sort of networks that Sarah was describing of NGOs and, and other um, ways that, that the U.S. and other Western powers um, get their influence felt. Um, and, and, and by uh, openly neo-Nazi organizations um, <clears throat> that have been built up over the last couple of decades in Ukraine um, that get funding from the wealthiest oligarchs uh, in the country and that um, uh, the leading, the, the most um, uh, powerful of which is a, is a political party ironically called Svoboda, which means freedom. Um, and which entered the parliament in Ukraine in 2012. And these were the forces underneath that were really pushing this movement forward. And in, uh, last, at the end of last February, um, it succeeded in overthrowing the elected government of Viktor Yanukovych. Um, uh, immediately afterward, uh, two things happened. Um, one was that on the streets of Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities, a reign of terror began with uh, fascist street gangs sweeping in um, to, first of all, um, to the offices of communist and socialist organizations, um, then other opposition political movements, um, uh, and uh, basically taking over these offices, driving people out, in some cases beating and torturing people um, in the streets. <laughs> and then mass arrests began after that. <clears throat> um, the other thing uh, that happened was that immediately after the coup, um, the United States pledged $10 billion in aid, um, which uh, John Kerry went personally to deliver the first billion dollars of it um, to the leaders of the coup. Um, and uh, since then, um, billions more in aid, direct and indirect, has gone to this regime um, um, through the United States, um, uh, through the IMF, which the U.S. basically wrote the agreement with the IMF and pushed it through. Um, and, and untold, we don't know how many millions and billions of dollars have gone into NATO as a result of the so-called, you know, Russian threat to Ukraine. Um, which has, you know, uh, been dominating U.S. policy in Europe now for the last several months. Um, 
it's interesting to note uh, that, um, you know, uh, or for us to remember as activists that um, uh, back at the time when, uh, the, when Gorbachev and, and th that cast of characters was um, in charge of the, the last days of the Soviet Union, um, that the uh, U.S. had agreed to, uh, one, one of the things they had agreed to was to not expand NATO if uh, the Soviet Union made all these concessions that they wanted to make. And what has happened uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union is that NATO has expanded relentlessly to the east, pushing ever closer to um, Russia's borders. And in fact, one of the things that um, uh, the European Union agreement that was um, being demanded by the Euromaidan movement, uh, one of the, th the provisions of it was to allow NATO to establish military uh, installations within Ukraine, and which of course sent very serious alarm bells ringing in Moscow and elsewhere. Um, after the coup um, in March, um, uh, uh, groups in, of, in, of people in Crimea seized government buildings and called for a referendum. An overwhelming 97% uh, of voters who participated in the referendum chose to uh, disaffiliate from Ukraine and rejoin Russia. Um, uh, and that set off a chain reaction throughout Russian, the largely Russian-speaking southeastern part of Ukraine. Um, where um, things like uh, language rights had been stripped immediately, Russian language rights had been stripped by the, the new regime, um, and, and the, the posture of the uh, far-right nationalist government that took power in Kyiv was to uh, essentially dehumanize a large part of the population in that part of the country. Um, uh, in April, um, Kyiv launched uh, what is called the anti-terrorist operation, uh, which basically is their side of the civil war, attacking um, the most rebellious areas of the of the southeast in Donetsk and Lugansk, the Donbass dining, uh, uh, mining region, where um, people had begun to take up arms and form militias to protect themselves. Uh, and on uh, in May, uh, those two regions held their own referendum in which they voted, again, overwhelmingly um, to demand independence from Ukraine. And they formed what are called the People's Republics of Donetsk and Lugansk, or sometimes now referred to as Novorossiya, um, which is a, a, a union of the two. <clears throat> and the war continued unabated through the spring and summer. Uh, according to the UN, um, Officially, over 5,000 people have died since April in the war. Um, but even the UN admits that's a very uh, conservative figure. And it's, uh, most people think it's well over 10,000 that have died. Um, yesterday, the UN reported that 824,000 people in Ukraine have become refugees this year. Um, so. Uh, I think um, there's a there's a crisis situation happening right un that's unfolding right now, um, and uh, I think a lot of people aren't even really aware of it. Um, there was a ceasefire accord signed between the two sides in Minsk on September 5th. Um, only the Ukrainian, I, I mean, only the um, Donbass side, the the People's uh, Republics, have respected the terms of the of this accord uh, the Ukrainian military has continued to carry out um, violations on a daily basis with an, an average of eight civilians a day dying uh, in the Donetsk uh, capital region since uh, September 5th um, and uh, many forces within the People's Republics within the militias were warning that the Ukrainian government was using this breathing space to rearm and prepare for new attacks. Um, and in fact, um, we've seen in the past week a major escalation has started. Um, on Monday, this past Monday, there was a, 
a major missile attack on a chemical factory in Donetsk that leveled the plant and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and uh, uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk right now, people are, on, are again going on to a war footing. They ex they're expecting an imminent attack uh, by the reinforced uh, Ukrainian uh, military apparatus, which has been getting aid uh, throughout this ceasefire period indirectly through, from the U.S. indirectly through Poland, which is another NATO state. Um, and, uh, you know, so it could be that within the next day, within the next week, um, we see another major uh, attack uh, in that part of the world. Uh, this takes place also in the context of elections. Um, the Ukrainian right-wing regime is holding uh, parliamentary elections tomorrow, which, of course, ex will exclude the participation of any uh, opposition forces. Um, and uh, next Sunday, November 2nd, uh, the first uh, parliamentary and prime ministerial elections are to be held in Donetsk and Lugansk. Um, <coughs> also in this context, uh, this week, we've seen a, another major um, uh, propaganda escalation in the West with folks from uh, Brzezinski to George Soros coming out with major articles uh, calling for war with Russia mm -hmm. and saying that, um, you know, the U.S. and the West must put everything behind the Ukrainian uh, <coughs> government. It's, you know, it's almost unfathomable given um, what we know about, uh, you know, the, the war that's being escalated in the Middle East right now and in other parts of the world, um, that they would even be thinking about uh, escalating the situation that could so easily erupt into a war with Russia. Um, and yet that is the level of of crisis and um, irrationality that they are operating under in Washington. Um, I want to just quickly um, talk about, um, I think this is relevant to the movement, and also we, we aren't, aren't able to have um, a lot of discussion about Latin America today, but um, we can compare what's been happening in Ukraine and, and Donbass with the situation in Venezuela, which has a lot of parallels. Um, last winter, when we were out in the streets starting to demonstrate against the coup regime in Ukraine, we were linking it up a lot with the events that were unfolding in Venezuela, where there was a counter-revolutionary, reactionary, fascist-fueled movement in the streets that the U.S. was also promoting as, as democratic and, and in trying to undo the Bolivarian Revolution and uh, not only in Venezuela, but to also destroy its influence in Bolivia and, and other parts of Latin America. Um, the difference <coughs> on the ground is that in Venezuela, there was, a, there was and there is a powerful people's movement that's decades, been fighting for decades um, in an anti-imperialist, pro-socialist direction that has control of many state institutions and that has a uh, a movement in motion that can come out, they can call out tens of thousands of people to defend um, their struggle on a, on a day's notice if they have to. Um, in Ukraine, where there was a weak, pro -ca a weak capitalist regime was overthrown by fascist forces um, and unleashed against a divided movement, uh, a small movement that had to begin over almost from scratch. I mean, that's that's the difference, not the approach of the pro-U.S. and reactionary forces. The, they have the same approach in both places. It's an, it's a di the difference is the level of mobilization and determination of the people's forces in those places. Um, but, you know, that the, the, the far-right forces are continuing their war against Venezuela. Um, we can look, you know, in recent weeks at the murder of uh, the socialist congressman Robert Serra. Um, just this past week, um, the headquarters of the communist youth of Venezuela in Caracas was um, bombed with incendiary bombs in the middle of the night while there were people in the building. Um, and 
Fortunately, um, there no one was killed. Um, they were able to mobilize quickly. Um, but if you look at the, the pictures of the destroyed office um, that had been burned out um, afterward, it looks exactly like the, the scene of um, the House of Trade Unions in Odessa last mm -hmm. May. The only difference being that in those pictures there are charred bodies everywhere. Um, the, the approach, again, of the fascists, of the reactionaries, of the imperialists is the same. Um, and in the U.S. anti-war movement, we can say that, you know, uh, the difference is there's a much better understanding of the Venezuelan Bolivarian process and much more solidarity um, in the movement here, um, largely thanks to the influence of the progressive Latin American diaspora in the U.S. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the anti-fascist struggle in Ukraine and Donbass is not well understood. And um, I think that, uh, I'll skip over a little bit of this, but um, just to say that folks that I spoke to, survivors of Odessa, activists who are in exile, who are trying to help political prisoners within Ukraine, um, they understand um, the difficulties that we have in raising this issue here. Um, and they say that what is most needed from our movement in the U.S. is to help bring factual information and alternate points of view to the movement and to the workers um, on this issue. Um, and I, on that note, um, just to wrap up, um, uh, I want to announce that uh, here in New York, um, next Sunday, a week from tomorrow, November 2nd, uh, marks the uh, six-month anniversary of the massacre of 48 anti-fascists and trade unionists in Odessa. <coughs> and uh, there's going to be a demonstration. There are flyers on the table back there. It's at 1 o'clock, um, just a couple blocks from here at, at the Times Square Military Recruiting Station. Um, and we hope people will come out um, and join us in demanding uh, an end to the cover-up by the U.S. and the media on this <coughs> issue, but also um, raising uh, and alerting people really to the danger of the continued escalation of this war. That's it. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for their patience. We have one more speaker, and then we're going to go into questions and discussion. Um, and our final speaker is um, uh, Bernadette Lern, who is the chairwoman of Bayon USA. Uh, Bayon is a coalition of Filipino organizations, um, and she is the national chairwoman. And she's also a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. She's going to talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the U.S. shift of military forces to Asia. Um, Bernadette. Thank you. I was asked to speak about the TPP. Um, I'm not going to focus so much on the TPP other than what you already know. Um, it's <coughs> NAFTA on steroids. And it actually encompasses much more than just trade. It actually has serious implications on US foreign policy and the countries that we occupy around the world. Um, so. Why the U.S. military shift to Asia? First of all, the Obama administration labeled it a pivot back in 2012. It is not a pivot. Um, the U.S. has always been in the Asia Pacific region, especially since 1947 with the establishment of the U.S. Pacific Command, which is the largest of the global combatant commands of the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, and if we want to be technical, the U.S. has been in the region since 1848 in the Philippines, uh, which is the very first, uh, one of the longest uh, U.S. military occupations in history, and the first U.S. war of aggression. Um, so I'm going to focus on the issue of the basis in the region. What we're seeing is basically an escalation of geopolitical strategy in the region. And that geopolitical strategy has always been to control the region, to ensure U.S. economic hegemony, and now to control its greatest rival in the region in terms of economic hegemony, which is China. And the TPP really serves as the economic centerpiece right now for the military escalation in the region. Um, what is the role of basis, U.S. military basis? 
like Sarah said, um, militarism is never for defense. It's never for security. It's to ensure economic hegemony. And in the case of bases in the Asia Pacific region, it's to control the major shipping lanes that are crucial to US trade and commerce. The Asia Pacific region is the largest market for US exports. In fact, with the APEC countries alone, trade with the US amounts to over $3 trillion. So the US must secure its hegemony in the region. And, and it, it, is, it aims to not allow China to, to interfere with its hegemony. Um, the US Pacific Command is also not only in charge of bases, it's also in charge of um, exercises and military agreements. And I want to say that these agreements um, more or less enforce neocolonialism in the region. I'm going to zero in on a case of what's happening right now in the Philippines. Um, the Visiting Forces Agreement is more or less the main agreement that allows the rotational presence of US military in the region. And two weeks ago, a Filipina transgender woman by the name of Jennifer Laude was brutally murdered by a US serviceman, a US Marine by the name of Joseph Scott Pemberton. Um, he is currently in US custody because under the VFA and in other, these military agreements basically um, uh, stipulate that when US personnel commit crimes in the countries that they occupy, they are, the, the jurisdiction lies in the, with the US. So in other words, they are immune to the local laws of the countries that they occupy. And Jennifer Laude was not the first Filipino to be killed by US servicemen, and she will not be the last Filipino to be, ser to be killed by US servicemen. And um, in, back in 2005, uh, Nicole, uh, or Suzette Nicolas was not the first uh, Filipino to be gang raped by four US Marines, and she will not be the last. Um, Philippines to be gang raped by U.S. Marines. And this happens in all countries where the U.S. has bases, and not just the Philippines, in Okinawa, in Guam, in South Korea. So we see the continuing impunity and uh, the jurisdiction and uh, the jurisdiction that the U.S. Um, enforces over its own military personnel and how they don't allow um, criminals, you know, U.S. servicemen criminals to subject themselves to the laws in the countries that they occupy. And this is neocolonialism in another form. Um, so in the case of Jennifer Laude, Joseph Scott Pemberton is still in the custody of the U.S., although they have transferred him to a military camp. He's, he's still technically under U.S. custody. Um, I want to say under the VFA, the U.S. troops enter without passports or visas. They enter without clearances from our own customs or immigration authorities, without quarantine clearance from our health authorities, and without licenses nor registration for driving their vehicles in our country. They've gotten away with murder, rape, harassment of our women, maltreatment of Filipinos, and the destruction of our environment. Under the VFA, under over 40,000 US troops have entered the Philippine territory in more than 25 provinces in more, more than 78 naval vessels and fleets, and that include nuclear-armed aircraft carriers, submarines, all in clear vi violation of Philippine sovereignty. The VFA itself, as an agreement, violates Philippine sovereignty and our constitution. Um, another form of uh, soft power that um, uh, uh, Sarah was also uh, shared earlier was the fact that the U.S. also engages in aggressive counterinsurgency in the region and especially pacification by way of humanitarianism and U.S. aid. Uh, U.S. aid is very, very active in the Philippines as is a very strong pacification campaign to subdue and subjugate uh, real resistant movements on the ground, real revolutionary armed struggles on the ground. Uh, we see that now with um, the, this quote unquote peace process with the Bangsamoro people. The Bangsamoro people are a Muslim minority um, in Mindanao and um, they in have engaged in this so-called peace process that have, has led to this so-called peace accord. Um, what it basically is, is a, is a pacification campaign. It's not a real peace process. It's basically a campaign to divide and conquer uh, the various armed revolutionary groups in the region, and in this case, the Bangsamoro people have been waging a str armed struggle for self-determination for over 100 years. And in history, throughout history, there have been 
uh, relentless attempts to subdue their armed struggle and to divide them. Um, and none of them have, have worked. Uh, so what is our role here? Our role here is to really um, uh, build genuine solidarity with the resistance movements in the Philippines. There is a very vibrant anti-imperialist, anti-US interventionist movement in the Philippines, not only on the streets, but in our legislature and also in the countryside with the revolutionary armed struggle. Um, don't believe uh, the corporate media's attempts to demonize these revolutionary armed groups. They are freedom fighters um, and they are f genuinely fighting for the liberation of their people and to set up a revolutionary government to replace the despotic um, current system, rotten system in the Philippines that's very much um, uh, backed by US imperialism. And I'll leave it at that, and uh, we'll, I'll answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Well, as you can see, the U.S. has its hands everywhere around the world, and it's our duty to stop, to stop them. Um, as we're, you're formulating your questions and discussion, um, I want to pass this around. Maybe you can throw something in it. Uh, in the way of money, um, so that it, it can defray the cost for renting of the room. So maybe uh, you can do that. And um, the first uh, person in our discussion who I want to call uh, as an important announcement um, is uh, Amit Gupta, who's a NYU law student. Uh, Amit would like to talk about an event happening, which uh, I encourage everybody to participate in. <coughs> There's no, this mic is just, it's not a, you just oh, got to okay. speak, it's just for the camera. Okay, yeah, so if you've seen the flyers that are on your chairs or if you got them earlier at the Block the Vote event, basically NYU Law has taken over a forum called the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society. Uh, it seems like a mundane <laughs> academic forum, but this is a forum run by a guy named Thane Rosenbaum who argued this summer that everyone in Gaza should be considered a legitimate target based on the fact that eight years ago, uh, they voted for Hamas. And this is a guy who describes himself as a human rights lawyer. He's been welcomed at NYU, yeah, at NYU Law. Uh, so uh, he's running this forum, and uh, you know, la last week he brought Ayan Hirsi Ali, the woman who argued that Islam is a death cult and that the Constitution shouldn't cover equal rights for them, and that Benjamin Netanyahu should deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. So he brings uh, this person, and then tonight he's actually doing something a little bit worse. He's bringing uh, uh, Ray Kelly, the former NYPD uh, police commissioner, who actually was not only responsible for stop and frisk, but actually was involved in spying on NYU students um, because they were Muslim. Uh, as well as Ray Kelly, one of the torture lawyers who helped uh, justify and rationalize uh, the George Bush torture policy. And there, Michael McCasey, no, sorry, where did I say? Anyway, uh, uh, he's bringing Michael McCasey. Um, and they will together be screening a movie called Zero Dark Thirty which is the uh, CIA vetted torture film about how torture is necessary to catch bad guys, whatever. Uh, and they'll all be doing this under the aegis of the NYU Law School. So this is a law school putting on an event and hosting a, a forum that basically brazenly opposes and you know, insults the idea of the rule of law uh, and you know, gives a forum for hate speech as well as hate acts against not only people around the community but even inside the NYU uh, community. So we've organized a demonstration. We've also organized an open letter uh, asking that NYU law distance itself from this forum and not give um, not only these ideas, but these individuals and their actions uh, kind of a sort of veneer of legal legitimacy. So uh, the flyers should be on your uh, chair, or there's some in the back. We'd really like it if we could get a bigger community response, because a lot of times the law school purposely tries to insulate itself from the community, which is you know, governing over and mistreating. Uh, so, uh, if you guys could come out, that'll be at 6.30 tonight by the NYU Law Campus. That's at, uh, uh, right by Washington Square Park, uh, Washington Square South, uh, 40, 40 Washington Square South. Um, and uh, you can also sign on to our open letter as an individual or as a, an organization asking that the NYU Law uh, Administration distance itself from this board. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, questions, discussion? Um, this man here followed by this man here. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, I've been following the, uh, the Palestinian struggle since uh, 1976. I became an activist then. So I've seen uh, Menachem um, Begin and, uh, you know, uh, 
Arafat and uh, Rabin, the Oslo Accords, Geneva, Camp David, I've seen all that. And it looks to me that a real big problem is uh, Abbas and Fatah. They seem to be very <coughs> corrupt. They seem to be helping the Israelis uh, enforce the occupation. So is there any movement that you know in Fatah where they can uh, get rid of Abbas or something? Because Abbas, if you give him another hundred years, he'll negotiate for another hundred years, you know? That's what, that's what he wants to do is negotiate. So is there any uh, movement to get rid of Abbas? Um, well, Abbas has said he doesn't plan to stand for the presidency again, and he is old and not getting any younger, so I'm inclined to believe him. Most likely, the next time there are elections, they will have to find another candidate. Uh, first, you're next. Brother, I'm and, uh, you mentioned the reconstruction of Palestine. Do you know where the materials for that reconstruction are being manufactured and how they are being distributed? Yes, uh, large portions of them are manufactured in Israel. There have been some studies done these past few weeks about how Israel is really making a killing off of this. First they bomb Gaza, then they profit from reconstructing it. And even when materials are shipped in from outside because of Israel's control of the crossings, they're still able to profit. The state is, through the fees it charges agencies like the UN to allow these materials in. They charge what they call coordination fees. So they manage to make money off of everything some way or another. <laughs> The Israelis are copying on protests. Yes. Thank you. Further discussion? Some women's voices? Um, men can raise their hand too. Thank you. Well, I, I, uh, well, I have too many questions. Thank you so much uh, to the speakers, outstanding. And uh, I know a little bit about everything, but uh, refreshing my memory too. So it has been great to listen to you. Well, about reconstruction, I'm going to have one as a few questions. Reconstruction uh, is only through the UN because I'm reading a book here where uh, Palestinians, young people that are write about their experience, are talking about funds coming from uh, one of them is Turkey. You're writing about uh, the, treating Gaza rights back, right? Huh. Yeah. I think I know. So, uh, so I, I don't know if only comes the, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, who is going to control that money? Because it is, from where it is coming is a good question, you know? And how can we really make some difference? I mean, why is Israel is going to profit from their own destruction, you know? And uh, so that is one. Um, about uh, Sarah, thank you so much for your... Uh, uh, one of the things that I would like to know more is about uh, Libya and what is the role uh, that is at this moment uh, playing or what's, what is going on with Libya. And, um, and, and, uh, and Greg, uh, when you compare Venezuela and uh, Ukraine, uh, yes, I agree with you 100%. Now, the, the difference, I think, is Venezuela has the whole Latin America supporting Venezuela. So um, I wonder if uh, the regions around, around Ukraine, they are uh, some way um, quiet, supporting what, what, what happened with the area around. Thank you so much. Oh, no, one more, please. Uh, Filipinas, I have relatives from Philippines. And I, I feel very much um, deep about Filipinas because it's almost the same problems with Latin America. And I am Latina and, and so very proud to be. <laughs> and, uh, and the problem is, well, you, you, you talk about the resistance in Filipinas. But uh, how big are they, and how extended, and what is the, the power that they really have, and, and what to do with this um, um, military that has been there forever? You know, if there is anything. You say there are uh, people from the left in the legislature. I mean, is there any possibility of writing a law or a bill 
that I can control this. Thank you. Yeah, um, so to answer your question, I'll go, kind of go backwards. Is there a hope in writing a bill that will somehow just erase the U.S. military? Currently, no, not under the current system. The current system is run by um, uh, a bit, we have a we have a problem with the government. The basic problem with the government is it's run by landlords. And these landlords, they fight for the crumbs of, you know, U.S. favoritism. And until such time uh, we can change that system, there will always be U.S. military in our country. Um, so there is a strong uh, anti-imperialist bloc in, in the co Philippine Congress right now. These politicians or these party lists are under attack on a daily basis. These politicians are being killed on a daily basis. So we're facing grave, grave uh, attacks on us as civilians. Um, so extrajudicial extra killings in the Philippines have been very rapidly on a weekly basis of progressives of the left. Um, and I'm not even touching on the countryside yet. On the countryside, it, there's a war in the countryside, so that's different. And so your question about, um, your question about the armed left, um, well, they are underground, uh, though we don't engage in um, Taking up arms ourselves as Bayan, we don't see them as uh, we don't see them as terrorists. We don't see them as bad people. We respect their choice, and it's a choice of millions in the Philippines, especially the poor, to take up an option. It's a noble option. Um, how big are they? How big are they? Um, they're significantly big. I can't give you exact figures. I mean, a lot of the tactical offensives is never reported in the news. Uh, the corporate media in the Philippines really reduces and minimizes their numbers, so we'll never get a very objective figure of how big they are. I can say this, um, so many counterinsurgency ha campaigns have been launched by the Philippine government, they've never worked. Um, there's always been an armed struggle on the ground. They've never been able to annihilate the armed, the armed movements, um, particularly the New People's Army, and even the Bangsamoro armed groups, they've never been able to uh, annihilate them. They're still there, and they're and they're and they're they're growing in numbers. That's all I can say. Um, now, one thing about the visiting forces agreement is that the U.S. just recently um, signed a new agreement called the EDCA, or the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. The visiting forces agreement basically says the U.S. Uh, troops can be there as advisors, as um, to conduct exercises, joint exercises of the Philippine military. What the EDCA basically now stipulates is that now the U.S. forces can now engage in combat. They can actually participate in the civil war between the armed forces of the Philippines and the New People's Army that has been waging for the past 45 years. So this is, this is a problem. Um, and uh, the U.S. intervention is now going to interfere with the U.S. with the Philippine Revolutionary Movement. They can now engage in combat with the Philippine with the Philippine Revolutionary Movement, because now they can all they're not there just as advisors. They can also bring their tanks. I mean, the tanks have always been there, but now they can officially bring their drones. The drones have always been there. There have been drone strikes in Mindanao that have been killing Filipinos. They are never reported. Um, so, the left in the Philippines has always been under attack, but the left has never gone away. Um, the left is still uh, every day. The, the biggest recruiter to the, up to the left right now is the government itself, because the government is so terrible. So the more, and the more Filipinos go hungry in the countryside, the more they take up the option of taking up arms. Greg, can I go next? Um, well, thank you for your question. It's um, um, very important. Um, the, the main um, support for the resistance within Ukraine and, and within the Donbass republics. Um, the most important source of, of support is um, the people's movement inside Russia and the other former Soviet republics. Because that, especially in Russia, that pressure from below is what's keeping the government of Russia from making um, or being able to make the kind of um, accommodation that, that there's, they're under a lot of pressure from the wealthy forces inside Russia to make an accommodation with Kyiv, to make an accommodation with the EU and the US to the extent that they can. Even though that's 
to do that would be suicidal, basically, because the U.S. wants to do to to Russia what it's already done to Ukraine. Um, and there's a you know we've seen it's very interesting we've seen a real resurgence over here in the media they talk about Russian nationalism separatists this and that but what really has happened is that there's been a resurgence of um, what I would characterize as Soviet patriotism that is the sort of internationalist um, solidarity between the countries of the former Soviet Union um, is expressing itself in solidarity with what's with the anti-fascist movement in Ukraine. Um, outside of that immediate area, I mean, a, a lot of the other countries to the west and south of Ukraine are directly under NATO. They're NATO puppets, basically. Um, and so there, there can't be really strong support there. But it's interesting that in Europe, the strongest um, su support is in the two countries where um, you know, they have a long tradition of anti-fascist resistance in Germany and in Spain. Um, and from Spain, um, that has, we, it's interesting that also that it's spread over the summer. Now there's a, a growing, quickly growing movement in Latin America in solidarity with the anti-fascist movement in Ukraine, um, uh, which, you know, it, it started in Chile last winter and now it's uh, almost every country in Latin America has a growing solidarity movement, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so, and, and let me just take the opportunity also to say, while I was there, um, people thanked me again and again for the actions, which from our point of view are very modest. <laughs> um, the, the meetings that we've had, the street protests we've had, the UNAC days of action, um, Everyone there is aware of what has been done here, even though from our point of view it might be very modest. Um, it has an impact not only on people's morale, but also um, it has a real impact in terms of um, giving more credibility to what they're saying um, with the media, with um, uh, even with people in their, in their country, if they can come to them and say, Look, even in the United States, people are coming out in support of what we're saying. It really makes a difference to them. Joe. Okay, um, I should make clear that I'm not an authority or an expert on reconstruction or the aid sector in general, which is fairly complicated. Um, but I can tell you that there are a number of agencies that will be involved in the reconstruction, both UN affiliated, like United Nations Relief and Works Agency and the United Nations Development Program, um, those funded by individual countries as well as local Palestinian agencies. Uh, there was a donor conference in Cairo a couple of weekends ago at which Qatar, which you mentioned, was the foremost donor. They pledged, I believe, an even billion. Of course, the pledges made at these kinds of conferences sometimes don't show up. That's happened before, especially in the case of Gaza. But at the moment, it seems that the overall process will be done through this agreement, supervised by the UN and the Palestinian Authority on terms dictated by Israel that work to Israel's advantage with Israel profiting richly from it. Further discussion? I, I oh. Asked a oh, I'm sorry, I miss Sarah. <laughs> um, I wanted to segue into the question on Libya by um, first touching on uh, the importance of resistance and the inability of the U.S. to defeat uh, people's resistance coming from below and and certainly the Philippines is quite an example uh, of that and and the ability of the movement there to sustain itself is extremely important and and we could also look at Palestine I mean we, you can't imagine the amount of sheer firepower put on Gaza a population of Brooklyn uh, and, and about the landmass um, and yet the ability of the people, even with all the surveillance and the drones and the, and the 
able to capture every message sent from a cell phone, and yet somehow the Palestinians were able to build thousands of tunnels and an entire underground network and come up right behind Israeli lines and make it impossible this time for Israel to move into Gaza City. Uh, I mean, that's quite an in incredible accomplishment when, when you think of it. I, I can't even really fathom how it is possible, but it is. And, and also in the Ukraine, you can look at the terrible, the loss of life, the, the fascists that, that now control the government, and yet the very fact that there is an armed resistance in the East that has taken major cities and been able to administer the cities and feed the population and organize a resistance, who would have thought? In the Ukraine, I mean, it didn't look that way if you consider last year or at the time of the coup. Mm -hmm. So, and and that, whether in the Ukraine or in Palestine or Philippines, you know, you could look at any of these countries and say, it also inspires uh, a kind of support and solidarity that becomes a break. And that's true in, in Russia. The fact that there's grassroots support makes it hard for a deal against uh, the people to be made. And, and it's also true in, in Palestine. As much as there may be forces that want to make every conceivable kind of rotten deal, they can't because of the, the pressure of the people. Now, in Libya, there is a kind of, um, and this is all too often, the, the U.S. thought it would be easy. Defeat Gaddafi, and here's a small population, and uh, aligned along really the Atlantic in these modern cities and they just destroyed the cities, destroyed the electrical grid and the water and man-made river and I mean what was done in Libya was just horrendous. But they thought it was easy. The oil would just continue to pump. What, what did they care about the people? It hasn't turned out that way. And there is now in, in response a kind of uh, like warlordism going on where Egypt has forces and, and clans and military groupings, and so does Qatar, and so does Saudi Arabia. And they're arming each of them, and actually sending jet aircraft and bombing each other's positions. But I'm sure there's also a resistance on the ground that we haven't heard from and that we will hear from, because the, the heritage of what was built when Libya controlled its own oil, the highest standard of living in Africa. That, that's going to be heard from again. Mm -hmm. um, so their solutions are always to try to break these countries apart and, and engender sectarian warfare. It was, if you talk to anyone from Iraq or Syria, even a few years ago, they would say, there's no difference from Sunni and Shia. Most people didn't even know what their neighbors were. Under the U.S. occupation, everything was stamped. Every neighborhood, every family had to declare. Every, every dollar that was spent was decided on a sectarian basis. And 10 years of that uh, puts a poison. And, and yet, the people in resisting that have to consciously build solidarity on a new level. And so I, I think our um, confidence needs to be uh, consciously in extending solidarity to forms of people's resistance and knowing that it is, you know, it's like seeds that come up again and again. It is engendered because it's the only solution. People find that, that what they had relied on is destroyed and they have to look to themselves. And so examples, you could go anywhere in the world today and, and people feel Palestine is their struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's um, true. And it's true also in a growing way for these other uh, movements and, and struggles. So uh, I, I don't know of... Um, a progressive grouping in Libya right now. I, I think all of these. But the modern resistance was asking about Libya, about the petroleum happened, the situation of the population. Well, the, the petroleum uh, production is way, way down and um, is part of what is being fought over. I mean, there were direct pipelines right from Libya under the Mediterranean and into Italy. That's of sweet oil. 
and that is not, you know, what is happening anymore. And um, Europe, who wanted to cash in the EU on all of this, um, and we're told it's the only way they could have, they could sustain their oil is finding that they're on the losing end, whether it's the pipelines in the Ukraine or, or the oil that uh, came in the past from every time they cut down these pipelines, whether what came through Syria or now through, through Libya, they're, they're finding out they lose also. They lose uh, in these wars and in the responding uh, chaos that, that comes. Are there further questions? <coughs> Two. Yeah, uh, I just want to take a little bit of a different uh, look at this whole question because this uh, forum is, is on U.S. wars and U.S. wars at home and abroad. And I and probably a good deal of people in this room uh, have been involved in the fight against U.S. imperialism since the days of the Vietnam War. And there's one thing I think that's important to uh, understand in terms of the different time that we're in, right? During the Vietnam War, U.S. imperialism was a good deal stronger. And so while they were waging uh, the war against uh, Vietnam and the other countries in Southeast Asia, they still had money to build the so-called Great Society here, okay? Uh, this is very different. Uh, today, right? At the same time as the U.S. is waging wars from Iraq to Syria to Philippines to Ukraine and so on, they're attacking the standard of living, union rights, whatever, working people in the United States, attacking oppressed peoples, uh, as in Ferguson, although that's been going on for uh, well over 50, 100 years, right? Uh, but it also gives us you know, different opportunities which we really need to learn how to take advantage of, right? Uh, we need to be able to take these questions of what is U.S. imperialism to working people in the U.S. to combine the struggles, whether it's for the $15 an hour minimum wage, uh, tax against union rights and so on, with the, uh, the question of, of U.S. wars abroad, right? Uh, and I think we have to look at it that U.S. imperialism is a common enemy of the people in the oppressed countries abroad and the working and oppressed peoples at home. And we need to see how we can bring this together and bring this, you know, to the working people in the U.S. One comment let me make on that, even though I, I'm not one of the speakers, is um, one of the greatest things that happened during Ferguson was when the Palestinian people um, uh, expressed their solidarity and gave them, um, uh, you know, said, we know about occupation. Um, and last night at the Black Agenda Report um, meeting, and I'm sorry that, um, uh, that uh, Margaret uh, had to leave early, um, that was a big part of the discussion. And they said, Ferguson has happened all throughout this country, but one of the things about Ferguson <laughs> is the people <coughs> stood up. When they tried to send in some of the traditional more liberal civil rights leaders and tried to put them up front to speak, the people in the streets in Ferguson who had stayed in the streets didn't accept it. Right. And um, they also, uh, the program that these people put forward was great, you got everybody's attention, now it's time to register everybody to vote. Get off the streets <laughs> and let's register everybody to vote. They didn't accept it. And some of the organizations who saw some of the leaders of these young people in the streets of Ferguson and tried to say, um, well, now is, you know, let's give them some money to work on and this organization. This, and for people that don't have money, when you're offered money to do something like that um, and change your politics, you know, but this hasn't had much success. And this is why a lot of the people at the Black Agenda Report meeting last night were so excited because they really saw a fight back and were hoping for a new burgeoning of a movement um, in this country. And I, I agree that there's not, it, it, during this period, during Vietnam, one of the ways Vietnam people were bought off after a round was huge concessions, you know, um, in terms of where they worked and union contracts, in terms of civil rights and women's rights and, and, and so forth that were given and trying to 
buy some of these people off and, and um, lessen the movement, they can't do it anymore. You know, they're in a real um, crisis. One of the ways you could see the crisis is, you know, you see the stock market keep on going up, um, and they talk about the gross domestic product. Even the gross domestic product, even from their sense, has been growing for the last couple of decades at a level which they define as a recession level. After the 2008 recession, after every recession, month, month or so later, as an economy says it's recovering, it becomes a rehiring. It's never happened with this one. But when you look at the gross domestic product now, more than 40% of it used to be down around 8 and 7%. More than 40% of it today does not relate to the production of goods and services. It looks at these financial schemes that they're using that's still creating money. And the, uh, the economy has been growing with these bubbles, with the housing bubble that bursts, with the electronics bubble that bursts. And today, the entire stock market is one big bubble. And they do not have the ability to um, uh, give the kinds of concessions they have before. And so they change the way they're talking about the economy. That's what globalization means. That's what TPP means. That's what NAFTA means. That's what um, uh, uh, neoliberalism means, where they're trying to go and privatize everything in this country from Detroit to uh, con other countries in the world where they're also privatizing their water and people that yesterday could drink no longer can afford to drink and are having to, to get water where they can. They can't make those concessions anymore. They're going to have to um, go forward and uh, the people uh, um, will, will uh, not be able to be bought off in the ways they were before. And I think we're going to see a resistance. And that's our future. That's why UNAC has to keep on going to fighting these wars. Um, uh, they have to have wars now. Sarah used the word endemic. It is endemic to our system. They're continuous and they're simultaneous. It's not just one a generation anymore. And there's wars on the city streets in the, in the United States. And there's wars on city streets all throughout the world. And we are the people that are, are going to fight that and, and change that reality. And that's one of the reasons why UNAC has to keep on going and keep on fighting. And I hope you all join with us. There's also a little bit of a commercial, but thanks. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Oh, hi. Um, and I'm going to ask Sarah about Iran. What do you think is going to happen with the negotiations? Most Iranians don't think anything's going to happen. And what do you think the future will be as far as after Syria, what the U.S. plans are? <laughs> um, I thought it was very important at the very moment that there was a NATO meeting in Wales, which um, by the way, Joe was able to be there for that from UNAC. But at the, at the time that was going on, and Obama was announcing this new coalition of the willing on Syria, they also suddenly announced that the sanctions on Iran had been increased by 25 banking <coughs> and, and major um, industrial corporations in Iran. Uh, right in the middle of, there, there were the five plus one negotiations going on with Iran and, and, and during that time the sanctions, a number of them were to be lifted and others were to be put on hold. How, how is that even possible that it could happen during the negotiations? So there's, is it contradictory? Is it that they can't get themselves together? Uh, it did immediately make uh, the Iranians uh, wary and on the alert because um, what can you then expect? Uh, it doesn't bode well for any kind of a successful agreement if the sanctions are being increased. Now, but another thing is happening and that is more and more countries around the world because the sanctions are so destabilizing, not only on Iran but also on Russia and, and, and the, the, the threat of sanctions is that they're trying to find more trade and exchange among themselves. I mean, that's part of what's going on with the BRICS and, and whatnot. Um, so so it's, a, it's a very uh, contradictory thing. Now, part of the, the way in which the sanctions on Iran were so dangerous was it was a demand that every country in the world participate in them or they couldn't trade with the U.S. or use credit and banking 
so that was very, very strict uh, on Iran. Um, but quite a number of countries immediately sought ways around it, um, even in the European Union, but also China and India and Pakistan and, and Iran's immediate neighbors were saying, we're not going to abide uh, by these sanctions. So it's one where, where the U.S. is making more and more threats, but is less and less able to carry it out because their own productive capacity has gone down, the value of the dollar has gone down, the, um, the being the center of economic exchange. This is an empire in decline and decay and less and less able through economic means to impose its will. So they can declare sanctions, but they really can't um, totally enforce it. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, um, it's a threat we should take seriously, uh, but it has not, since the very beginning of the uh, Iranian Revolution, there have been sanctions, and yet it has not stopped Iran from developing um, pretty flourishing um, economy and, and, and an ability to provide a fairly high level of um, educational and, and technical uh, standards for the, for the population. A, a lot of the sanctions are actually designed to hurt uh, the w working people in the poorest part of the population because they want, they want to do things that will undermine uh, the government. So they're, they're directed not at the, at the richest, uh, and there's a capitalist, a strong capitalist class in Iran, um, but they're directed at the um, ability of the um, central government to um, provide health and, and uh, pharmaceuticals and, and things like that. So in that way, they're very sinister too, and, and we really should oppose every form of, of sanctions on Iran. But, Will it stop the, um, the Iranian government? No. And Iran has continued to assert its right to develop nuclear energy, which it absolutely has that right even under international law. So we're going to take a last group of speakers, but before that, Bernadette's going to make an announcement and then I'll get to Yeah, I just want to announce speakers. that um, next Sunday at the Asian American Writers Workshop, uh, we're going to be having a report back um, Sunday, November 2 at the Asian American Writers Workshop. That's 112 West 27th Street, uh, 6th floor. Um, part of our work as BIN is we're forming a new coalition of young Asia Pacific Islanders. Right now we're called uh, U.S. Out of the Asia Pacific. And we're really young, we're really young. Um, I mean, I guess in relation to the entirety of the U.S. anti-war movement, we are really young. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, we've been working closely with Nodutol for uh, Korean Community Development and CAP, organizing Asian communities, to form this coalition that we're actually hoping to expand across the U.S. And this report back is gonna be, we sent a delegation to the Philippines this past summer to Mindanao to look at the impact of U.S. intervention in the region. We're going to be reporting back on our findings on Sunday. So please join us. It's going to be 6 o'clock. Um, we're going to patch in some people from Mindanao to talk also about the Bangsamoro struggle in more in greater detail. So thank you. Okay. Uh, one, two, and we'll make the, the last. Go on, Marty. Just a moment. Uh, the speaker who was in Gaza, a uh, couple of questions, I guess I got a comment. Uh, how are people, uh, ordinary people, feeling about their resistance? You know, in the United States, we, you know, accuse the Hamas leadership of putting uh, civilians at harm's way. And I, I think the resistance in Gaza was absolutely brilliant and inspiring. And I wonder how the ordinary person is viewing uh, recent events and also how uh, they feel about joining the, um, the, uh, the uh, PLO government with Abbas, how they feel about uh, that new hookup, which has many dangers in it, of course, uh, from our point of view. Just, just a comment. Uh, there's been some uh, uh, interaction by 
the mayor of the city, de Blasio, with Israel. And recently the uh, defense minister was here a couple of weeks ago and thanked de Blasio for his personal defense of Israel. Of course, de Blasio has always been an Israel supporter. Uh, not long ago, he said that defending Israel was, quote, my job, end quote. And of course, there's hundreds of millions of dollars in Israeli bonds that the city owns, and we need to, to take that up. Also, people may not be aware that uh, uh, the de Blasio administration in court is using the same arguments as Bloomberg uh, against those who are suing the police department for their targeting of Muslims. And uh, the de Blasio administration is using the very same arguments that Bloomberg used uh, to deflect that suit. So those are my comments. Just the last comment also, what, just one, one last footnote. Uh, he, de Blasio met with Modi of India, the new uh, president there, or prime minister, I forget, who was denied a visa in this country because of his incredible racism uh, of his right-wing party back in India against Muslims and Sikhs. So uh, de Blasio has got a uh, poor record so far. Yes. I, I have a question and a comment. The question is, <clears throat> we heard that young people in Palestine, young Palestinian people, uh, are thinking and pushing for the, I think, the only rational solution, one state, secular, with human rights for everybody. Is that true? And how strong is that? Now, the comment is this. We are talking about crisis of the cap of capitalist system. Saving the difference with Germany in the 30s, the crisis also gives rise to extreme right, fascist. I call the Tea Parties the SA because there are similarities. So what do we do, brother? Okay, uh, yes, I, I'll just go down the list. Um, the resistance is tremendously popular in Gaza. Its popularity always peaks at times of Israeli aggression and Palestinian resistance or defense. So at the moment, it's, yeah, it's overwhelmingly popular. I think everyone nearly everyone supports it. And I should make it clear when I'm answering these kinds of questions about public opinion that I'm neither a pollster nor a spokesman for anything. I can only tell you about my impressions based on conversations with a lot of people, but certainly not everyone. Uh, you mentioned something about the discourse in this country about putting civilians in harm's way. I don't know if that was a question, but I'd like to say something about it. You know, one of the justifications, which never made much sense to me, even if it were true, which it isn't, but one of the things that Zionists will say in defense of the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in 1948 is, oh, but they abandoned their homes. They fled. And now we hear that other Palestinians, it was okay to kill them because they did not abandon their homes and flee. I think this is an example of how you just cannot win talking with Zionists. It's not worth your time. In terms of joining the PA, that's also something that's tremendously popular. To be honest, I think everyone recognizes, or nearly everyone agrees, that the, stat the status quo, the division, Gaza's isolation from the West Bank and the rest of occupied Palestine is simply not something that can continue for any number of reasons, humanitarian, political. It's just not a feasible situation. Uh, de Blasio, not much more to say about that. I don't care for that guy. Um, and one state sentiment, it's, it's a mix of opinions. I don't know if it's really that if it really runs according to age, but you'll find Palestinians with 
a broad range of opinions, different versions of one state, as well as support for a two-state resolution, which looks increasingly unlikely. It's not clear where this Palestinian state would go, especially in the West Bank. But it's not an unpopular option. Um, it's honestly a conversation that hasn't really happened that much in so internally to Palestine. There hasn't been a great deal of internal debate about what Palestinians would like to see going forward. So I think that's probably a prerequisite to whatever happens next, the next stage of the struggle. Have I answered everything? Did I miss anything? Well, we can, you can talk individually to people. Before we break up, one last um, announcement, um, and then um, please come up and speak to the people, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, do, do stay around and talk. Uh, there's free literature on the tables over there. Uh, don't let us take home anything. Go take a piece of everything. Uh, that's always great. Uh, and just to summarize, uh, there is this demonstration at NYU tonight against this, uh, really this, this promoting of some of the most reactionary Zionist and stop and frisk and Guantanamo. Uh, it, it's just very important. That's at 40 Washington Square South at 6.30. Across the street tonight at 11.99, a very important meeting for the Cuba Five. In, in, Oh, I'm College. sorry. Okay, excuse yeah, me. John Jay, not far. Yeah. Very, very, 59th Street. very close. 524, um, I think, west. So keep that in mind as the other possibility, either downtown at Washington Square Park or over at John Jay. Uh, reminder of uh, what Bernadette mentioned of uh, the Philippine events next Sunday afternoon, and also to we say. The Asian American Writers Workshop, uh, which is at 112 West 27, that's between one six, plus, sorry, 112 yeah. West 27th, sixth floor. It's also, you can also dial and, in, correctly. Yeah, it's also available online, it's a webinar. But um, visit a buy-in, buy-in-usa.org for the details, yeah. And then also to say there is this picket line in Times Square next Sunday at 1 o'clock, commemorating both the Odessa uh, massacre, the attack and burning of the House of Labor, uh, and also the, the new attacks coming down in uh, East Ukraine. So uh, try to join us at those events next week, at events tonight, and we will see everyone here, I'm sure, in the streets. And we're uh, UNAC is planning a major conference uh, in the months ahead, so we really will be s sign up so that you're alerted to that and can actually participate in the building through workshops and panels of that conference. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, I'm sorry you had to lug that around. Uh, I ended up not using it.